Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Fantastic. I should say I'm deaf, so if I get soft, just wave at me or throw something. That's a bit of Higgs boson. So what I want to do first is welcome you all everybody, can you hear me? to this Fantastic. event. I should say I'm deaf, so if I get soft, just wave at me or throw something. That's a bit of Higgs boson. I think we've just solved that problem. Thank you, Mia. That's one of my ex students. <laughs> He's got snatch mouth since he got it. <laughs> okay, so I think I'd like to go back to showing these slides. Am I actually doing that? Hey, uh, Sam, can you verify that I'm showing the slides? Yes. Thank you very much. So I want to tell you tonight about what happened 10 years ago today. But for, before I do that, I want to tell you that it's all about you tonight and asking questions. And so you can ask, if you're online, you can ask questions through Slido. If you're in the room, you can ask questions through Slido. However, even though you're asking questions this way, we're not going to actually answer them yet. You can hold us to the fact that we will answer them, but it'll only be after all of the different members of the panel have spoken. And this is to enable us to get through the story and then give plenty of time for questions. So the first thing I'd like to do is say a little bit about how Oxford has been involved in the discovery and elucidation of the Higgs boson. And I want to do that on behalf of all of these people. There's about 1,700 of us in the physics department. And we all want to say a warm welcome to you tonight. Of course, you can't get 1,700 people on a slide like this. Uh, but I have uh, included a few special people that we've hired in the last couple of years as new assistant professors on this slide. And so they say welcome to you as well. Now, you probably know that the 20th century has been, it was an amazing thing for science, but the beginning of the 21st century topped it. There were two truly remarkable discoveries at the beginning of this century. The first was the Higgs boson in 2012, and then gravitational waves by LIGO in 2016. And tonight we look at the first of those discoveries 10 years on. So as you know, or probably know, the Higgs boson was discovered at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, and CERN announced that discovery on the 4th of July, uh, 2012. CERN itself is the world's leading particle physics laboratory, and it was set up in the aftermath of the Second World War with the aims of achieving and sustaining peace in Europe and peace in the world, and at the same time doing that through truly outstanding science. And it's met its mission, its crowning glory so far is the Large Hadron Collider, of which we'll be talking a lot in this uh, talk tonight from many of the panelists, that enormous machine, the largest machine in the world, was put together by more than 10,000 people in a global enterprise. The collisions that the LHC produces and that might produce a Higgs particle were imaged by two remarkable detectors the size of cathedrals, digital cameras called Atlas and CMS. And many, many, many thousands of people, 3,000 on CMS and 4,000 on Atlas, have helped to build these cameras and then study what they produce. And these are drawn from around 250 institutions around the globe, including Oxford. And today, there are many, many people in the Oxford particle physics group, and this is almost all of them. They work at the Large Hadron Collider, but also they work at other important machines around the world, and also in outer space and deep underground. But the remarkable CERN laboratory, which enabled the discovery that we're celebrating tonight, began very simply in a field outside Geneva in 1954. That's a picture of the groundbreaking. In 1955, the foundation stone was laid. And in 1959, CERN, for the first time, won the world record for the most powerful accelerator, the proton synchrotron. And that proton synchrotron was masterminded by a person who was also a fellow of Wolfson College, Oxford, John Adams. Today, there is a center here at an Imperial College and also at Lord Holloway to recognize that he was the father of the giant particle accelerators that we have at CERN today. In 1959, when the world record was broken, he announced that 
at CERN the next day, and that's a picture of him in that year. He was only 34 when he came to CERN, and at the age of 39, he had broken the world record. He then masterminded and built a larger machine in a seven kilometer uh, uh, circumference tunnel with the super proton synchrotron. And that and the earlier machine built in 1959 are still used today and are key parts of the Large Hadron Collider accelerator infrastructure. Now, another thing that he did was he pioneered the building of the Large Electron Positron Collider. And why that's important is because it sits in a 27 kilometer tunnel, the same tunnel that's now used by the Large Hadron Collider. And he was the person more than any other that envisaged way back in the 1980s, that when you build a tunnel, when in the 1970s, when you build a tunnel, if you're going to build a tunnel, you should use it multiple times because they're very expensive to make. And so he said it had to be big enough to have the magnets of the Large Hadron Collider. And this is the cover of a, one of the proposals in 1984 that illustrates that. And you'll also see in 1984, there was the physics case to the machine, and that was given by a guy called Chris Dewellen Smith, who was a theorist. He'd been working at Oxford and then at Stanford, and then he came back to Oxford. And Chris Gowen and Smith uh, eventually presented to the governing body of so the idea of the Large Hadron Collider at the beginning of the early 1990s. And at the time he presented that idea, the president of the CERN Council was another Oxford physicist, Bill Mitchell, who was an expert in neutrino scattering. Now, the NXG was approved. And shortly after that, Chris became the director general of CERN. Now, as the Director General of CERN, that's the boss, you imagine that you have immense power. However, Chris is a theoretical physicist, and the NHC is a triumph of engineering. And so the engineers recognize that whilst Chris has to give the OK, he doesn't know a great deal about the details theoretically. And so whilst he could give some guidance on the machine, he had to defer to the head of the machine, called Lynn Evans. And then one day, Lynn Evans came to Chris, and he said, Chris, this is one decision I'm very comfortable for you to make. What color would you like the magnets to be painted? <laughs> and so this is the color Chris chose. And you could say, well, why did he choose that color? Because it was the closest paint they could find to Oxford Blue. <laughs> so there were other important players in those early days of shaping the Large Hadron Collider program. Another person was Roger Cashmore, another Oxford professor who was a research director at CERN and made very important contributions to shaping the overall physics program, including for two of the other big experiments at CERN, called the LHCB experiment that studies beauty quarks, and the ALICE experiment that looks at the collisions of ions with ions, that's nuclei with nuclei, looking to try to understand and elucidate the strong force that holds nuclei together. Now, when the LHC was conceived, it was realized that it would produce a massive amount of data, and there was a great deal of concern about whether it would be possible for all the computers in the world to actually analyze that data. And so they relied on Moore's law. It would take many years to build the LHC, and during that time, there'd be a doubling of computing results, but there also needed to be ways in which computers could talk to each other and data could be shared. And for that, some came up with the World Wide Web, which was developed by Oxford undergraduate, former Oxford undergraduate student, Tim Berners-Lee. And so you can see that throughout the preparations for the turn of the NXG in, the, in 2009 and 2010, that Oxford played a very important role in many ways. So now we'd like to talk about what was done and why it was important. And I have with me tonight some of my dearest friends and colleagues. First, to speak about why the Higgs boson is so important, that's Gavin Salat. Gavin is a Royal Society and Research Professor at Oxford, a Fellow of All Souls, and a Fellow of the Royal Society. Then we would hear about the work that came before the Large Hadron Collider turned on, and that led up to the LHC discovery itself at CERN, and what that discovery was actually like, from Professor Daniela Bortoletto, who's the Head of Particle Physics, and was a key player in that early discovery at CERN in June of 2012 that led to the announcement in July. We'll follow that with Chris Hayes, who played a very important role also in the discovery of the Higgs boson, studying its decay to other types of boson called Ws, and he'll explain what they are. And then we're going to look to, at more recent results. First, we're going to hear about how the Higgs decay 
disintegrates very rapidly, sometimes to beauty faults, which are very hard to see. But that trap was achieved by people here in Oxford and other places around the world too. And that was presented for you by Philip Linschafer, who's a graduate student of Daniela's. And then we're going to learn about how very, very recently indeed, the Higgs has been found also disintegrating to muons, which are heavy electrons, for the very first time. And it's just only a little bit of evidence for that. It's not yet conclusive. And that'll be presented by Mia Zagubich, who is a former student uh, of mine at Oxford. And then, if we're really, really lucky, at the very end of Mia's talk, we might get some news, some late-breaking news from CERN, where some important results were presented today. And that might, just might be given to us by Sia and Yang. It's another, another one of our, our students here uh, in Oxford. And so I want to stop at this point and introduce Gavin. Gavin. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? So let me start by saying that I'm a theoretical physicist. Um, that means my experimental colleagues here will never let me anywhere near this. <laughs> um, so rather than telling you about something that comes out of a piece of equipment, uh, I'm going to try and give you a picture of why some of this work matters. Why the hate goes on and the physics associated with it is so important. Okay, well, that's a good start. <laughs> Doesn't seem to be this. Completely not this one. Yes, unplug like this. Okay. So that's an example of my talent. <laughs> Still not uh, responding. So when a theory is such as something, mm -hmm. it, uh, it sometimes goes dead. That seems to be what's happened here. Um, Do you want to use mine? So this is, um, so at the LHC, there are two very large experiments, um, Atlas, which is represented here, and CNS. Um, and the reason you always build two experiments is precisely this one. <laughs> So let's see if I can find the slides. Okay. We're in business. <laughs> so I'd like to tell you why the Higgs is important. And uh, rather than diving straight into the Higgs, I'd like to start with something that most of us are probably familiar with. Uh, and that's the idea of the Earth and the energy. All around us is something which physicists call a field, uh, which we draw with these lines here. And, you know, uh, it's something that we don't notice. No. Okay. If we were to turn it off, we wouldn't immediately notice any difference. But it's something that with the right tools, we can detect, we can reveal. In particular, a compass was invented almost 2,000 years ago. 
Now, one question that physicists like to ask is when you find an example of something, for example, of physics, is that the only example it's out And what was discovered uh, 10 years ago was evidence, more than evidence, certainty, that around us there is another field. Field called the Higgs field. It's quite unlike the magnetic field. And perhaps the way in which it's most unlike the magnetic field of the Earth is that if you take away the magnet that is inside the Earth, the field disappears. The magnetic field is no longer there. You need a source, a magnetic source, in order to have a magnetic field. The Higgs field is different. There is no source for it. It doesn't need a source at all. It's just on the whole time. And it's on here, in this auditorium, it's on the center of the Earth, it's on the universe, billions of light years away. Now, you need something a little bit more powerful than a compass to reveal it. Um, that's where the LHC came from. You need a machine of this magnitude in order to reveal what's going on. But this field is there and how it works. Now, a lot of particle physics is pretty esoteric. Extremely heavy particles, particles that last for 10 to the minus 24 seconds in the decay. But the Higgs field and Higgs physics, we believe, connects to us in our everyday experience in ways that are remarkably crucial. And I'd like to illustrate that uh, with reference to the particles of which we're made. So we're made basically of three kinds of particles. Between up quarks and down quarks. And if you glue those together, you get protons and neutrons, which are in the center of atoms. If to those you add in electrons, you get the atoms of the field. So, where does the Higgs field come into this? Well, the standard model hypothesis, and this bit of it really remains a hypothesis, says that the masses of these three particles, and of most of the other particles of the world, comes from interaction between those particles and the field. And the stronger the interaction between the particle and the field, the larger its mass. For example, the electron has a pretty weak interaction with the heat field around us. Uh, the down quark has a somewhat heavier one. Now, those, if this is true, then those interactions are responsible for the remarkable features of the world around us through the masses. And one example of this a proton is made of an up quark, another up quark, and a down quark. A neutron is made of a, an up quark and two down quarks. So, essentially, the only difference between is swapping an up quark for a down quark. And the up quark is lighter than the down quark. So that means that the proton is lighter than the neutron. Now, there's a, almost a rule in physics that if you've got two things that are closely related and one is heavier than the other, the heavier one will eventually decay into the lighter. And that's what happens with neutrons and protons. Neutrons last for about 14 minutes, and then they decay into a proton. And you don't actually find lone neutrons anywhere in the universe. You find them bound to protons. That is, I mean, the sort of physics of the binding makes them last forever. But the protons themselves, you do find. Protons are hydrogen. Uh, now, if we switched off the Higgs field, it's not something we know how to do. But if we switched off the Higgs field, then suddenly the neutron would become lighter than the proton. And protons would decay to neutrons. And that means that hydrogen would disappear. 15 minutes later, you know, half of the hydrogen would be gone. Another 15 minutes, half of that is gone. Our world would change tonight. Chemistry and biology disappear. All of that supposedly because the, these particles interact differently with the Higgs field. Each of them interacts with the Higgs field in a very specific way. That's not the only example where the Higgs field matters for us. 
Um, so masses here can make the proton stable. Uh, masses of the, the mass of the electron uh, is what sets the size of atoms. So if you halved the interaction with the Higgs field of electrons, you'd all double the size. Great swimming if you could uh, uh, you could increase the interaction of the Higgs uh, with electrons. And the W mass sets the lifetime of the star. Governs how fast determines how fast reactions happen right in the center. So these masses are crucial. And the question we want to ask is, is it actually the interaction of particles with the Higgs field that is, second, that is the origin of this? This is one of the questions we want to come back to, the answer to. So I mentioned the Higgs field. And some of you may be wondering, well, what, what about the Higgs boson? This here is a picture of the Higgs field in space. Now taking two dimensions of space, and the vertical direction uh, shows us the magnitude of the Higgs field. And everywhere around us, the Higgs field has the same value, so this looks very flat. What is the Higgs boson? Well, one way of thinking about it is that it's an excitation of that field. But locally, that field is changing in value at some very, very high frequency. And that excitation is the Higgs boson. So when people create Higgs bosons at the LHC, what they're doing, they're actually perturbing the Higgs field around them and seeing the impact of that perturbation on various reactions. And one example here is shown here. So you take, you could like collide two particles and they produce something very heavy, something that interacts very strongly with the Higgs field and excites the Higgs field. You need the Higgs boson for that, sort of lying around them for a very short amount of time. 10 to the minus 22 seconds. And then that Higgs boson decays, uh, for example, into two top quarks, which are very heavy. And those two top quarks annihilate the little signal in the detector. How strongly the top quarks interact with the Higgs field uh, determines how often that reaction happens. And what we're trying to do is to test whether that, the strength of that interaction is the strength that is required in order to create the top mass. Does the top mass come entirely from that interaction, or is it some other source of the top mass? And by measuring the rate of reaction to rate, you can directly answer that question. Now, one of the remarkable things uh, is to come up with this mechanism in the first place. Uh, Higgs and his colleagues who came up with it didn't actually come up with it for the Z and W bosons. Those people didn't know about those particles. They came up, up with it as a general theoretical idea. For how do you give mass to particles that can exist? And it was Weinberg a little later who pointed out this could explain, this could be used in a theory of weak interactions. What was remarkable was that even though that theory, that idea was there to give masses of uh, particles that carry Forces, forces. It turned out to provide a very economical explanation also for how matter particles get mixed. Now, today, what do we know? Well, we know that the W and Z bosons get their mass from interactions with the Higgs field. And we also know that the heaviest mass, the one called third generation, the top quark, the bottom quark, and the top, also gets their masses. Interactions. And that's among the amazing things that have been shown over the past 10 years, really establishing that. So, we're going to hear about some of that. Uh, so, after Daniela gave us an introduction to the discovery of the Higgs boson, uh, Chris Hayes will tell us how we know that the W boson gets its mass from interactions with the Higgs field. Uh, Philip is going to tell us how we know that the bottom quark gets its mass. Now you might object, I've told you that the Higgs field is so important to us because it gives mass to the electron and the up and down quarks. Today, we don't actually know if that's true. Um, in fact, we don't have, even have a way of, we don't even know how we could figure that out. Whether that's true. But Niho will tell us about a step on the way about how maybe we can start to get evidence 
but it's responsible for a somewhat lighter part of the moon. Uh, and finally, we'll have the bonus presentation. You see where I'm in. Uh, will tell us about what we know about the masses of these organisms. These are but some, this is but one of the many questions we're asking about these organisms. And too many to fit on a slide. Many, many other questions that we're asking. Because the Higgs boson is so central in terms of creating mass. Uh, many people think that if there's any physics we understand the model, then the Higgs boson must go away. So there are many other dimensions that I could tell you about, but that'll be for another occasion. And right now, I'll pass on to Daniel. Thank you, Gavin. This was a fantastic introduction and um, nothing coming up on my computer. Ah, yeah, okay. There you go. Okay, so I would want to take you um, on the road to discovery uh, of, the, uh, from the, of the Higgs from the Tevatron, which was a machine in the US to a machine, of course, uh, in, in Europe, which is called the LHC. And the beginning of the road was uh, uh, this paper uh, written in 1964 by Higgs et al, uh, describing the existence of this field, which is very important for us, and uh, describing that we will um, know that this field is there by discovering the Higgs boson. And, uh, at the beginning of the road, some theorists also told us, and these theorists were um, John Ellis, Marie-Claire Gaillard, and Dimitri Nanopoulos, also told us, uh, pointed out some ideas about what you should do to, to find it, etc., and where to look for. And at the beginning, in their paper, uh, they were looking at mass ranges. You see, this is in MEV, okay? So they were looking at the mass ranges of about 3 GB, three times the mass of the proton, which is way smaller than what we know now the Higgs boson um, mass is. But it was also entertaining, it's also entertaining reading this paper because the end of the paper tells us that we should perhaps finish with an apology and a caution. We apologize to experimentalists for having no idea of what the mass of the Higgs boson is and for not being sure it's discovering to other particles, except that the problem very small. For these reasons, we do not want to encourage big experimental studies. <laughs> uh, we didn't listen to them. And in fact, this is the road, and sorry, this is very deep, okay, but maybe what I wanted to tell you is that there was something going on in Europe, which was this tunnel that is, was described by, uh, by um, it, that was described by Ian in this presentation. And then there was also the American attempt. So the American attempt was a, um, a collider which had a circumference of about uh, 6.3 kilometer, okay? While the LHC is much bigger. It has a circumference of uh, 27 kilometers. They started up LEP and the Tevaton about the same time. It was the 80s. So the LEP started at the end of the 80s uh, and the Tevatron started up in um, 83. And then, you know, um, as you can see, you know, the collision energy increased to 1.92 TV, the top fork discovered. And then after the discovery of the top fork, you know, we went to try to discover the Higgs boson. But we were shut down in 2011 because LEP started in uh, 1989. Uh, by 2000, the experiment at LEP thought that they might have seen some sign of the Higgs boson, but it didn't turn out to be the Higgs boson. It was a, some background at the lower mass. And, uh, and then the LHC started up. And again, we discovered the Higgs boson in 2012. So, why was it so difficult to discover the Higgs boson? And actually, as Gavin said, is that to create the Higgs boson, you need to create, for example, top quarks, which are very heavy particles. So that doesn't very much happen very often. 
So you need a lot of energy for that to happen. And, uh, and then this uh, top quark can interact to produce a Higgs boson. But this happens extremely rare. For example, at the LHC, where we achieve a, a center of mass energy of 13 trillion electron volt, it happens one times in a billion. While instead at the Tevatron, it happened one time in a trillion because the machine was at, at a lower energy. But also there are other things that add to the complexity. And one of the things that add to the complexity is that the Higgs boson, once you produce it, it decays in 10 to the minus 22 seconds, a number that I cannot even think about. It's very rapidly. And then there was a third problem. The standard model predicts how you should look and find the Higgs boson once you know the Higgs mass. But they didn't know the Higgs mass. And so we had to find the Higgs boson and look everywhere. So, um, and in fact, it's easier to find the Higgs, mass, the Higgs boson if it has a mass above 135 GV, a mass of 170 GV, so almost the sweet spot, because then it decays almost only in WW, as Chris Hayes will tell you. But below uh, 135 GV, it mainly decays into BB quarks, which, as Philip will tell you, it's very hard to find. So, um, so we had this task that we were looking at something and we didn't know where to look and what to look for. So my experience started at the Tevatron, and I, I'm just telling you the story from, from my point of view, let's say. Uh, I joined CDF as an assistant professor at the Purdue University. And uh, in run one of the Tevatron, we discovered the, uh, the top work. And uh, my student, Mark Cruz, here in this picture, uh, looked at one of uh, the decay channel of the decay of the top. And uh, then uh, in 2000, there was a very nice report showing that uh, the Tevatron would have a chance of making a free sigma and we call this free sigma, we call it evidence, because it has still a 0.3% chance of being just a fluctuation from the background. So in particle physics, usually we go for five sigma. That is our rule. But we, you know, we had a chance at three sigma, and it was already quite interesting. Um, so CDF created the X discovery group. The name, you know, it's a sort of make it, you know, everybody, you know, optimist. Um, uh, and uh, my student, actually, Mark, became the leader of this group. I became the convener of one of the subgroup. And I started to develop a passion for uh, building silicon detectors, which are really important for uh, the detection of the heat. So unfortunately, the, the machine didn't work very well. So I installed, uh, you know, a detector which was called the SBX2 for Run2 in before 2001. And as you can see here, this plot practically is a number of events, uh, and we needed about 10 inverse Panto bunnies. Another way, inverse Panto bunnies, is our way for us uh, uh, to to count the number of events that uh, we had. And you can see that the machine really worked terribly. Okay. Then. You know, there was a change after 2003, around 2004, and the machine started working better. But can you imagine if the Tabatron would have worked as well as LHC, as soon as LHC would have worked? You know, this curve could have happened, you know, we would have got the data much earlier. So not only you have to build the machine, but the machine has to work very well, and at the beginning, if you have competition especially. So we felt like, at the Tevatron, we felt like it was David versus Goliath. So the experiment I was working on at the Tevatron was CDF. It had a diameter of 12 meter. Uh, CMS, which is a compact muon spectrometer at, at the LHC, at a diameter of 16 meter. And Atlas, the huge one, has a diameter of 25 meter. And also, you know, this detector took data, you know, uh, in the 90s. So, you know, it was built with older technologies than this detector. So it was also a detector that was not as performant. But anyhow, we were optimistic and we had the clock 
there was a clock in the where you know in the where they were uh, running the uh, the beams when we were taking the data in the control room of CDF, and there was another experiment called D zero as well, and we were counting down to when the LHC was supposed to start, which was 2009. 2008. So um, I was uh, leading one of the group. I was leading this group here, where the Higgs is uh, decaying to BB bar and is produced together with a Z boson, the quantum of uh, the weak force, when this particle decays to neutrinos. We don't see neutrino in our detector. So what we see is what is missing. We, we sort of measure every other particle and we use conservation of energy to infer that there was a neutrino there. Um, so it was a very challenging uh, channel. And uh, you know, people at the time thought that uh, um, you know, it was very difficult to get the data out of it, but we did it. And we introduced many improvements. And we started to use machine learning which again is an essential ingredient, as it will be shown later on by Philip, in the detection of the X to BB channel. It's a very complex channel with a small signal to background, so you really need the machine learning to extract this signal. So I had like four students getting their PhD, one after the other, each with more data, and each introducing more machine learning trying to get there before the LHC, in a sense. And that was our final result. So here is the mass of the Higgs. And this gives you, uh, you know, if there was no Higgs, we, our, we should have observed this dashed line. But uh, we saw this enhancement in the black full line is what we saw. And there was this very broad <laughs> enhancement uh, you know, around uh, between 115 and 135 GV, which, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it was really, it, 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 you know, it was consistent with what was eventually seen with much more precision at CERN. And this had a statistical significance. You see here are the two sigma band in yellow. It was a little bit above two sigma, but not quite three sigma. So there was a chance of one in 550 that the result could be just a fluctuation of the back. So, um, but I was not only working at the Tabatron. I joined actually CMS, one of the experiments at LHC in 1996. And I was building the CMS silicon vertex detector, which is absolutely beautiful. And eventually Ian joined me in this effort in 2001. And really, this is a, is a jewel, isn't it? Ian? So it was critical that the analysis in CDF and in CMS were kept completely separate. You know, there is really, uh, you know, for example, you can never work in two of the um, CERN experiments together. You cannot work on Atlas and CMS. You can only choose one of the collaboration, okay? Uh, but again, I could work on CDF because it was at the Tevatron, but I had to really to keep a, a wall between what I was doing at the Tevatron and what I was doing at the uh, at LHC. Um, so I joined the H2ZZ group in uh, 2000. Um, work with, with my student on most channels, but I will tell you the story of this channel here, where each of the Z boson decays into electrons, and positron, or muon, and antimuon. And so you have a final state of uh, four electrons, four muon, two electrons, and two muon. And here I, you know, the opposite sign is in purple. <clears throat> so why this channel is so important? It's because it's absolutely beautiful, especially in the four muon final state, which we'll discuss later on by C1. The muon just stick out because the only particle that should reach the muon detectors should be the muons. Okay, so you can see a muon event, a four muon event with the muons in the final state. So it's a simple search, clean signature, accurate reconstruction. The Z background can be calculated from standard model. The instrumental background is tiny. Everything is fantastic. But, you know, 
We still didn't know the detector. It was a new detector. We worried by about unexpected instrumental errors. So one thing that we did actually was to look at the dimuon invariant mass when we have two muon and we reconstruct the mass of the particle looking at the momentum of these two muons. And this was, you know, for us a cross check, but a cross check that showed that at LHC using two muons, you could find all of the particles of the standard model that you had previously discovered that decays into muon in one go. And this was a plot that was actually provided by Ian Shipsy, who was studying the Upsilon. And this became uh, a very iconic uh, plot of the LHC startup. Uh, every candidate event was scrutinized. They had name, not very innovative name, A, B, C, D. And a huge amount of, uh, of uh, internal collaboration and competition. Uh, we established to maintain a common reference between the group and to have synchronization from time to time to see which idea we, which would lead to a better result. Because I, at the time I was a member of CMS and we wanted to be partners. Okay, so, but also each group in CMS wanted to arrive first. So it was really quite a, a quite interesting time. So in December 2011, we started to see some discrepancy with the null hypothesis, if there was no X boson. Here we plot the p-value, and you see that the p-value is especially bad, so not consistent with the null hypothesis as around 120 GB. And if you look at the, again, at the, uh, at the mass that you can reconstruct by looking at the four leptons in the final state, you see that we would have expected one event at around 120 and maybe a couple of events, three events around 104. So, but the combination of all other CMS results excluded the range between 127 and 600 GB. The lab analysis, you know, this famous accelerator that was in the LHC tunnel before the LHC, excluded the mass uh, be, below 114, and there were also exclusion from the Tether. So we knew that we were zooming in on the Higgs. Uh, so in spring 2012, the accelerator restarted at 8 TV. We went from 7 TV to 8 TV. Uh, I told you at the beginning, more energy, more Higgs bosons. Evident that the Higgs, if the Higgs existed, we should have observed it in our final state. So we are, are taking an aggressive approach, improve the physics object and statistical approach, and make the analysis blind. So this is something that we do very often in particle physics. You don't want to be biased, okay? So you want to look at everything in your event, but the region where you're expecting the signal. And my postdoc, Daniele Benedetti, uh, worked day and night to improve actually the electron identification. It improved by 30%. So the unblinding was planned for uh, June 13. The analysis review committee had, to, uh, had given us uh, the green light to report it to the collaboration the next day, or we were out of the combination. And the actual unblinding happened in the close meeting in the evening. And honestly, I still get the butterflies in my stomach if I think about that moment. Because really, you know, at that point, we didn't know what we would have found out. And I have only this very poor photograph to remind me of the event. I'm here with my postdoc. Here is what we saw. And here you see it a little bit better. So here is a peak of the heat post. So that night there was a celebration, champagne, uh, and then it's history. Uh, you know, you can see here the p-value now, only with, uh, with that analysis, only with the four left on final state, we were at three sigma, and then there were other modes, as Chris will tell you later on, and you see that the peak is then, uh, stands out much stronger. Um, and in fact, this channel, this analysis was a feature in the Nobel Prize talk when uh, Peter Higgs and Frank Engler 
received the Nobel Prize in 2013. So here are some pictures that you have seen already, actually, you know, the night before, uh, then the atmosphere of a rock concert with all the young students sleeping in front of the room where there will be the big talks by the spokesperson of CDS, CMS and, and Atlas. Uh, they managed to sit here while the front row was all occupied by the highest dignitaries. And here you see the spokesperson of, CM, of Atlas, Fabiola, and the spokesperson of CMS, uh, Joe Candela, and the director of CERN, uh, Ralph Oyer, saying, we got it. Okay. Um, and again, I was sitting in a, uh, with the press room in the council chamber, which is nearby, and I was sitting nearby a journal from the IOP, a journalist from the IOP. And uh, here is, for example, also uh, Peter with Ian and with John Ellis, the theorist at the beginning of the story almost, and Joe Candela having lunch after the, the conference ended. And here is my recollection of that day, of the 4th of July, uh, just joy. And the, uh, you know, this guy from the IOP said it, you know, he could see the smile. And remarkably enough, there was a joy, a tremendous amount of joy and happiness, but also almost the feeling that all the world was looking at what we were doing and rooting for us. The amount of interest in the discovery was mind blowing and very uplifting. And I was ecstatic to see the same happiness and joy in 2018 when my student Cecilia Toshiri here and Luca Ambrose, working with Elizabeth Schopf, unblinded the H2BB analysis and they saw evidence for the Higgs boson also they came into the debate. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Daniela. Can you can you hear me, Mike? Okay. Uh, so I, I just want to give a very brief uh, flavor of uh, what was going on here in Oxford uh, to, to, to where, during the leading up to the discovery and finding the discovery when the LEC was was preparing and turning on. Uh, and so what we were, what I was working on was looking for the Higgs boson decaying to pairs of W bosons, as as has been mentioned. These are the students and postdocs that have been working on this measurement through the years here at Oxford. So a small number of students who have contributed greatly to, to, the, uh, to the discovery and the measurement uh, at, at Atlas. Um, so, so before, to, to begin with, uh, I want to say why I, uh, I wanted to look for W boson pairs. So this uh, diagram has a lot of all the different kinds, lots of different kinds of processes that could that could be uh, seen at the at the uh, LAC, uh, and and the, the important one was is this is the, the dashed line is is uh, the level of, at which you could potentially discover the Higgs. So everything above that line is 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 a mode that you, is a process where you might be able to actually discover the Higgs, and the one with the largest uh, discovery possibilities are these green boxes over a wide range of the Higgs boson mass. And that's uh, that's when the Higgs decays to W boson pairs uh, and, and is produced and associated with, associated with some quarks. Uh, and so I so this continues if you go out to higher and higher masses, it continues all the way up to the theoretical limit of the Higgs Higgs boson mass. So this looked like a very good channel to be searching for uh, to Higgs e to either find it or rule out its existence. There was a small region down here where it could not uh, see uh, where it was now. Not, not above the discovery threshold. Uh, and so we had another person at Oxford, uh, Sinead Farrington, uh, who was working on this particular mode, which is the case of tau, tau lepton pairs. And I was working on the, on the Higgs boson decays to W bosons. So we had this, uh, this whole um, plan uh, in 2007, ready for the data uh, that was, plan that was uh, supposed to initially start up in 2007 and then pushed up back to 2008. And it started up and it started circulating protons in 2008. But then after a week, 
there was a, a catastrophic event where uh, there was a faulty connection and one of the magnets just got ripped apart. And, uh, and so this, uh, the, the CERN is in a very delicate environment, vacuum, uh, more of a less uh, less stuff in, in in inside the vacuum at CERN than than in, than in outer space, and so so they had to uh, it, it required basically a full year to uh, to to come back and, and work on this and fix the fix the accelerator, and uh, and in this time people started wondering if this uh, if this thing would ever work, uh, and in fact there were there were people dug up a paper that had been produced just a few months before. Which said that uh, the failure of all the accelerators producing large amount of Higgs particles, such as the superconducting super collider, which is another uh, collider that was canceled in 1993 that was supposed to produce Higgs bosons in the US, United States, uh, indicates that the initial conditions must have been arranged as not to allow these accelerators to work. So they actually had a theory that said that there, there's, a, there's a way to, uh, to for, for future events to affect the past. And, and this is a demonstration of this theory. And, uh, and the New York Times uh, picked up on this and interviewed these, these uh, theorists. Uh, and, and, and they talked about the, 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 the catastrophic event. And he said about it, this must have been a prediction that all Higgs producing machines shall have bad luck. Uh, one could even almost say that we have a model for God, that he rather, and he rather hates Higgs particles and attempts to avoid them. So, so this was, uh, this was uh, we, we may have been up against some, some more powers uh, against us that, than we thought, but we were we were undaunted, and we continued to uh, plan to look for the plan to look for the. Uh, oh, am I out of, out of range? Plan to look for the um, the Higgs boson in W boson pairs, uh, and uh, and so so the machine did start back up in uh, in in 2009 and 2010. We started to make measurements, and so the first things we wanted to do uh, was look for uh, just W boson pairs. So we didn't have enough data to produce Higgs bosons in any, uh, any abundance, but we could produce pairs of W bosons, which is the, the main background. And we could see whether we can actually reconstruct these W boson pairs. Uh, and so this, these plots are showing the first year of data, which is a small amount of data where the W boson pairs. So this is, this is uh, the, on the x-axis is the number of additional particles, uh, quarks or gluons that you might get with the interaction. And when you have W boson pairs by themselves, that, that they're produced by themselves, and so that you'd have no, no additional uh, stuff in there. And so that's, that's this white uh, diagram. It's most of your W bosons are down here, pairs. And so you, we, we tried to understand, this is Gemma Worden was working on this at the time as a student, trying to understand how, what fraction of events uh, uh, don't come with any additional uh, par particles. Uh, you have a big background of top quarks. And this is where you have top quark production, where you have additional quarks. And so, so you have to really uh, understand this distribution. And so as we got more and more data in the next year, uh, David Hall was, was working on this. We, got, we, could, we could more clearly uh, see more and more events, hundreds of now WW events. And we, we were ready now to be uh, looking for the, the Higgs boson. So we started to get enough data to look for the Higgs boson. And so we started making selection to really isolate where the Higgs boson could be and defining um, a, a distribution that might tell us uh, for different masses where it might be. And so this one shows for, in red, it's sort of hard to see, but uh, if you had a mass of 150 GB, you could see it's, it's sort of just separating a bit from the background of W boson pairs, which is in blue here. Uh, and, and so you, um, we, could, um, we, could, uh, we could potentially, we, we, we started to see actually, so we could see this 150, but we didn't see much there, but we saw stuff uh, down here. And we saw a little bit of an excess. We saw it also in, in, in different uh, bins of jets. So there's no additional jets or one additional jet. And, and so if you put these uh, plots together, uh, we, we, we saw something like there's only about a 1% chance the background <laughs> could fluctuate uh, to, to give us the, what we observed. So it's, it's hard to see with these, uh, with these jittery plots, but if you do a statistical analysis, there's only 1% chance that it would look like you'd have that many events or more in the data, just from background alone, uh, and so this was this was the uh, most interesting time in July of 2011 for the W for looking in W boson pairs because this was uh, this was the right at that point is the only channel that was seeing uh, some excess, so it was really the first hint, uh, what turned out actually to be the first hint of the actual uh, W boson, 
Uh, and I also show here this, this distribution that you, we were using to separate the, the two think um, distributions was developed by Ellen Barr here, here in Oxford as well. Uh, but so then we, um, by, the, by Christmas, so, so in another five or six months of data were, were taken and, uh, and other it started showing up, we started getting hints in other uh, channels. So we started seeing hints in this four lepton channel that Daniela, so just a few events, uh, and it was just, so we, in, in the w, WW pairs, it looked like it was around 130 GB, but in these, in these uh, more precisely, uh, more accurately measured masses in the four leptons and in the, uh, in, in the two photons, you started seeing excesses a little bit below that, and what turned out to be uh, 125 GB. So this was now, by, by this time, uh, we were getting, we were starting to really think that we were, we were, we were getting some, uh, s some Higgs bosons in there and that, uh, and that we, we would, we would, we would soon discover the Higgs boson. And so in 2012, when the, when the collider started up, it just became a race, uh, and just collect data, collect data, collect data and analyze it as quickly as possible, uh, to see if we could find who would be the first one to find it, which channel would be the first one to see evidence for the Higgs boson. Uh, and, and as it turned out, at, at the end of, uh, by the time we got to um, the middle of July, uh, all, all three channels had some, uh, some sort of evidence for this, uh, for the Higgs boson. So you can see the excess of uh, events, and you can then see that if you put in the standard model predictions, uh, you get uh, something that looks like uh, the standard model uh, Higgs boson, uh, Higgs boson. So, so this was this was uh, the, the culmination of all of the all of the work, and so we had then the, the discovery and a celebration uh, that uh, Daniela talked about. Where this is after the Atlas uh, talk, uh, and th these were the this is the, these are the distributions that went into the publication that's describing the discovery, and it included these three uh, decay modes, and 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 that was uh, that was the, uh, the the result of the uh, of the of the of the WW uh, measurement. So this is a picture I wanted to show just actually a picture of the team uh, it, uh, that was looking for it at Atlas. So you can see how many people were involved. This was just before, this was in uh, a workshop just before in the spring of, of 2012. So just before the discovery, we were we were working on trying to improve the, uh, the search and to try to get the data uh, analyzed as quickly as possible. Uh, I'm down here and, my, and David Hall, the, the student is, is right there. Uh, and, uh, and, and so you can see, get a feeling for how many people were involved just in this one particular decay mode and, and it's similarly in other decay modes. And this was uh, David Hall's thesis, which was a, a sort of won a Springer Prize and was published as the discovery and measurement of the Higgs boson in the WW decay channel. So uh, just in, as a last slide, I'll just show you a little bit now of where we are today. Uh, so this at, in run two, so at, at, in 2008, 16, 17, that they, we, we took more data. Um, in 2018, so this is the first year of data. And, and so you can see how much more uh, W bosons we're getting. We get hundreds uh, in this measurement. Uh, and this is postdoc Catherine Becker, who's now a professor at uh, Warwick and a student that was working on that. And then we have two students who just are finishing measuring. This is just came out uh, today, actually, this measurement of, uh, of the most recent, the full data set uh, from the from the from the uh, la last uh, LHC run, so we, we can see in this uh, WW channel we're having we have thousands of W bosons that we can measure and and uh, and determine its properties uh, ever more more precisely. So thank you very much. Okay, good evening, everybody. I'm going to tell you the story of the Higgs particles favorite decay channel. Now, I think by now you will have realized that all of us here are pretty fascinated with this Higgs particle. And Gavin earlier gave you very many good reasons why it's so important. And here's another reason. The Higgs particle is the simplest conceivable elementary particle. 
it's a structureless point-like clump of mass. It's simpler than anything else we have ever seen in nature before. At the same time, the Higgs particle is also extremely diverse. And it's diverse in the sense that it can leave many different footprints in our instruments that we use to observe our particle detectors. For example, what the Higgs particle can do is send large amounts of energy in two opposing directions, and they'll drop very, very prominently in our detectors. But curiously, these deposits of energy, they would seemingly be disconnected to the original production position of the Higgs particle in the very center of our apparatus. And that's because the particle that transmits this energy is a particle of light, and that's, that's actually invisible to our detectors. So something like this is very spectacular, and it happens around once every 500 times a Higgs boson is produced. Even more spectacularly, the Higgs boson can do something like that. It can disintegrate into four particles, four muons in this case, heavy electrons, which, as we heard, can travel throughout the entire detector, 10, 20 meters sometimes. And it's basically impossible to see, to, to miss them, because you can literally follow along their trajectories. But this happens only once every 30,000 Higgs bosons. Now, I'm telling you this because these two signatures have been observed in the data to the day 10 years ago. And this is what led to the original discovery of the Higgs particle. Now, if you look at those numbers, one in 500 or one in 30,000, you will realize that what we discovered on July the 4th, 2012, was not somehow an average typical Higgs particle. It was rather a very spectacular but exceedingly rare occurrence. And if all you ever if all you have ever seen of something was somehow akin to a winning ticket in the lottery, how well could you really claim to know something? In other words, what you should what you should really do is to try to understand the typical signature of a Higgs boson, the typical average footprint that it would leave in our detectors. And it would look something like this. Again, you would have two very large energy deposits in opposite directions, but this time you could actually see particle tracks emanating from the central position in the apparatus where the Higgs boson would be produced. And we could watch those tracks emerge as the collision happened, as the experiment was conducted. This is the Higgs particle decay into two bottom quarks, or beauty quarks, as Ian called them. One goes this way, the other one goes the other way. And in fact, more than half of all the Higgs particles, they would decay and leave this signature in our experiment. So it's indeed very typical. Now, at this point, I should pause and remind you of what Gavin told you about bottom quarks. We know today that all the matter around us is composed of around 90 different types of atoms. And we also know that all of those atoms are, in the end, nothing but rearrangements of just three elementary particles, up quarks, down quarks, and electrons. We also know by now that this is not the end of the story. This accounts for all of the stable matter that we know in the form of atoms, but there are additional fundamental particles. There's in fact a second and a third set of those particles, which as far as we know, don't produce stable matter. They can produce matter particles, but they are of a very exotic and very short-lived kind. And as it so happens, the bottom quark is a member of this third heaviest and most exotic family. And it is this bottom quark that the Higgs boson likes to decay into, and it does that more than half of the time, as I said. And this is how it will look like. Now, this is a very commonplace thing for the Higgs particle to do, but unfortunately, it's also a very commonplace occurrence in general. If you were to look at an average interaction in our experiment, which would not involve a Higgs boson whatsoever, you might see something like this. Or you might see something like that or something like this. In fact, for every single genuine Higgs boson decaying in its typical preferred way, you would have over a billion totally ordinary interactions, which would not involve a Higgs boson at all, but which would bear a striking resemblance to the thing you actually look for. And that means we have to put in a very large amount of work. We have to work really, really hard to be able to find those subtle differences between cases where we have a Higgs boson and cases where we don't. And fortunately for us, these subtle differences do exist. 
if you look at this event, if you look at this Higgs boson decay into a pair of bottom quarks, in our experiment, this would happen over a stretch of 25 meters. This is the size of the Atlas detector. If you were to zoom in on the very center of this event, you would see something very curious. You would see that those particle tracks that I mentioned, they would not originate from the point at which the Higgs particle would be produced, but they would be offset by a tenth of a millimeter. This is the signature of this very exotic type of method I mentioned before, which contains the bottom quarks produced by the Higgs boson. If, on the other hand, you were to look at an ordinary event, something that does not contain a Higgs particle, and you did the same exercise, you would not see such a displacement because there would not be this exotic type of P particle in your detector. So this is the type of thing you have to do. On 25 meters, a tenth of a millimeter actually makes the difference. And you have to do that not just once, but billions and billions of times to look at sufficiently many such events to be able to make some interesting statements about the nature of this Higgs particle. And this means it takes a lot of time and a lot of people and a lot of work. And we started in 2009 when the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, started up and people were really enthusiastic because experiments could finally begin. Now, with the first complete data set, it was sufficient to actually claim the discovery of the Higgs particle in 2012, and it caused the Nobel Prize in Physics to be given in 2013. But remember, this was based, this discovery was based on those very spectacular but very rare events. No sign at this time of the typical Higgs particle decay has been observed. What it took was more time and more data and more meetings and more discussion and more time still, and also a lot of coffee in the end, and more time until finally in 2018, what we saw was this. This red event, this red region here on the top right is the irrefutable experimental proof that the Higgs particles really do decay in a typical fashion. And you've seen this picture before already. These are my colleagues, Luca and Cecilia, who were part of the team together with around 50 other scientists who made this discovery. And here is my colleague, Thomas showing this evidence to the world. You can see it here on the screen behind him in front of an auditorium packed with a thousand physicists at the largest conference that we have in the field. This was in July 2018, almost to the day six years after the discovery of the Higgs particle. It took six years to go from we have found the particle to we have now observed something that it should normally do in many, many different cases. And this shows you that in particle physics, the discovery of the Higgs particle was not an end of the story. If anything, it was really only the end of the beginning of that story. And that story continues to be written. After 2018, we collected more data. And very soon, we will have a lot more data on our hands because experiments are going to start again. In fact, they will start again tomorrow at 4 p.m. Geneva time. And that means all of us here at Oxford Physics and in the particle physics department particularly, we are excited to be continuing writing this story. And my colleague Miha is now going to tell you a bit more about what's coming up. Thanks very much. Here we go. <clears throat> All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mika, and I was a graduate student at Vienna a few years ago. And uh, today, I'm, I will tell you about uh, a rare, a very rare decay uh, of the Higgs boson to muon pairs. And the search that I'm going to talk about today was so difficult. That despite being on the younger spectrum of the speakers today, I'm actually the only one that's retired from physics. <laughs> <laughs> right, so you've heard a wonderful story today, uh, beginning with why the Higgs is important. Um, and then Daniela took you on a uh, journey to discovery. Um, and, you, and you've heard about the, the, the triumph of the standard model in, in 2012. And you've heard about the champagne and, and the spotlight and, and the press. Um, but then, you know, throughout uh, this last decade, um, 
physicists uh, at Oxford, uh, at CERN, and around the world uh, have worked tirelessly uh, away from the spotlight um, to, to, to study the Higgs in, in more detail. So Philip, uh, that just gave a talk, um, uh, colleagues, uh, Daniela students, Luca and Cecilia, were, were one of those uh, scientists working on the Higgs BB decay. And myself and uh, Yingji, another student at uh, were working on uh, Higgs DZ along with a uh, postdoc here, uh, Chuck Martone. And so the, the reason why this uh, decay is difficult uh, to find and why it's important is uh, that it's the most sensitive way to probe uh, the Higgs boson interactions with second generation fermions, taking us one step closer uh, to the mystery of whether it uh, is responsible uh, for the masses uh, of the up and down quarks, the protons um, and electrons that make up uh, most of the matter. So I, I told you that the search is difficult, um, but the Experimental signature is actually extremely simple and clean. You are looking for two high energy muons that leave very striking signature uh, in the detector. And you're looking in particular for muon pairs which have uh, the masses close to 125 GeV, which is roughly the mass of the Higgs boson. Uh, and we'll hear about the updated measurements uh, from Sue, I mean, in just, in just a bit. Now, I like to joke that I have a PhD in counting because essentially what we do is count the number of these events and from that number infer how often the Higgs boson will decay to neon pairs. So, so why is it difficult? Why, why is it so hard that, uh, uh, to, to find this decay? Well, there's two reasons. And the first one is that this is a very rare decay. Um, and it's rare because uh, according to the standard model, light particles such as muons only couple to the Higgs boson very weakly. And it would be uh, only 2% of them, uh, sorry, 2% of the 1% of them that will decay to muon pairs. And this is illustrated by this, by this figure on the right hand side. And I had to go and find a special, special edition of this figure uh, just to include the muon uh, pairs. Normally they stop in order of magnitude the bottom. That's, that's, uh, that's the first reason. Now this still gives us about 1300 events uh, in, in the data sets that we analyzed. That's before any, any sort of selection. <laughs> the other reason is that there's a similar process uh, called the Drell-Young process, which is much more common. The Drell-Young process will have two protons passing each other and the quarks inside them uh, will interact, producing a virtual photon or a Z particle that will then decay into muon pairs as, as well as electron pairs. But the muon pairs is the ones that uh, are kind of concealing the Higgs boson. And the odds were not in our favor. This, is, this figure shows um, the invariant mass of the muon pairs on the x axis, and it shows the number of events on the y axis. Now, I should point out that this is a logarithmic plot, and that the, the light blue background, uh, which is the Drellian process, is, makes up the majority of the background, and it's much higher than these lines here, which represent the Higgs boson decay. In fact, in the figure in the paper, we had to scale up these uh, Higgs boson decays by a factor of 100 just to make them appear on the, on the figure. And in the end, in this region, where there's you know, between 120 and 130 GeV, where we have the most Higgs boson decays, we're still, they're still outnumbered by one to 500. So how do you, how do you find this in, this in this huge haystack? What's the strategy? Well, the first part of the strategy is, is to keep as many of these events as possible because you don't have very many of them. And if we, if we found two muons in the event, we kept it for further analysis. The second trick is that we will categorize these events in some way. The trick here is that if you have a small number of uh, Higgs boson decays and a, in a, in a large bin of Drellian events, if you can split them such that the ratios are different, the sensitivity of your analysis will slightly improve. Initially, we've done this by relying on our physics intuition, by knowing how the Higgs boson uh, uh, decays and knowing a whole lot about Drellian events. 
However, to improve the sensitivity of the analysis, we finally relied on uh, machine learning uh, classification, which, um, which where we use the XGBoost algorithm to classify events in different uh, categories. And finally, what we do is we count the excess of events. And to do that, we, um, so again, this, is, this has the, the mass of the muon pairs on the x-axis and the number of events on the y-axis. We uh, fit a combination of, of two models. One is the background model for Drelian process, and another one is the Higgs model, uh, so for, for the Higgs boson pair. And from, from, this, from this fit, we then extract the number of events that we have actually observed um, uh, in the detector. And that gives us further indication on what fraction of them have replicated in this particular way. Now, there, there was a lot of challenges in this analysis, but I'm, I only have time to, to uh, talk about one. So I'll give you the biggest, the biggest one, the, the, the hardest thing. Again, the schematic shows neon, neon mass on the x-axis, shows number of events on the y-axis. And this is the shape of the, the true shape of the Drelian uh, process. Now, the difficulty is, we don't really know this shape. We don't, we know approximately what it looks like, but we don't know what it is exactly. So that's why we have to use a model for it. And this is what's illustrated in this uh, blue line. And so the difficulty is that if we get the model only ever so slightly wrong, which is illustrated here, so it's, it's slightly uh, lower here than it should be, slightly higher on the edges. When we do the combined fit to the background only um, data, we'll get a spurious signal. So we'll get a fake signal just because we chose an incorrect background. Model. So that was the main difficulty. Right, so some of the results. After four years of work, we found a significance of two signal. And while that's not enough for evidence, it is very tantalizing because you expect, you expect it to be there and it's very close. So a few months later, a few months, a few months after my viva, the CMS experiment actually got it. They, they, got, they got to the three signal, which is considered evidence. And um, we, we're, still, we're still waiting for more data um, to get to the, the usual uh, five sigma uh, discovery. So this is, this is just showing a few of the people that were involved in this search. Um, there's, uh, there's Giacomo Marconi, who was a postdoc, helped us uh, a great deal in the analysis. Um, there's, uh, there's Ian, there's Daniela, there's Yingji, who's continuing on, uh, myself, and there's Suyan, who is going to uh, uh, talk about a um, measurement that was just released today um, about the, the Higgs boson mass. So, well, thank you, Miha, for the wonderful introduction. And I'm really excited to tell you about um, all about the latest results from today. Uh, is on? Is on? Hello. Sorry. Uh, I could, yeah, I could give that a try. Yeah, not even not even experimentalists are from. <laughs> Are completely immune to, to, to technical errors. Hello, is that better? So, well, um, and with the wonderful introduction from Miha, I believe I don't need to tell you what a muon is. So, I'll start with telling you what exactly I'm, I, I'm spending most of my PhD in. So, instead of uh, so for the bulk of my PhD, I'm actually looking at something on the top there, which uses the dead boson, which uh, is, as you might remember from the other talk, is a, a carrier of the weak force, and it decays into a pair of neons very, very quickly. And what I do in, for my PhD is I measure the neons um, kinematics, such as how fast they move, how fast they are traversing through the detector, very, very precisely in the Atlas detector. And the reason why I'm doing that is because it allows us to make a better measurement of the Higgs boson. As you might remember from Danielle's uh, talk, the Higgs said that 
to for that one kind of it's one of the discovery channels for the for the Higgs boson. And it's really it's got this really beautiful event signature where you can reconstruct fully everything in your detector. So this is why. So and the reason that I'm really trying to push for the higher precision for the muon uh, for the muon uh, measurements is exactly for this. So we have on top the atlas counterparts of the uh, the atlas counterparts of the uh, of the Higgs discovery channel, and in the bottom we have today's result for uh, with much higher with much higher precision measurements. Hello. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> well, you guys heard me, right? Yeah. Very good. So, is there any way I can try to continue? Okay. <laughs> so, as you can see from the comparison between the two plots here, we have much more statistics compared to um, compared to what we have ten years ago. So. Uh, what we call five sigma events is really at the end of the day no more than a handful of events as you can see from the top in the tiny little blue box around 125 GeV. Whereas in today and by today's paper, we have more than 200 of Higgs candidate events. So no more of the ABCD uh, numbering or any of the uh, any of the known intuitive numbering there. We just we just collectively call them all the six uh, Higgs events. So the of course the additional statistics matters a lot for the for the Higgs mass measurements. But additionally, what I have talked about before that I spent most of my PhD on to model the uh, the muons very accurately is also incredibly important for us to determine where exactly that peak is, where, where exactly that peak is in data. So this is um, so this is today's measurement. This is essentially the state of art. Uh, measurements from the atlas, uh, the atlas experiment. Um, Thank you, Ms. Better. Sorry? That's no, I, uh, so, okay. I think I, I think somehow it lost off. <laughs> I don't know why the latest experiment is so prone to technical errors. You wanted this? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so, so yeah, this allows me to just present to you the uh, latest number for the Higgs math measurement in the Higgs of that, that um, well, uh, Higgs of that, that, that decay channel. And well, it is 124.99 plus or minus 0.19 dollars GEV or all your local equivalents. <laughs> we have shaped off successfully a third of its uh, systematic, uh, a third of its total uncertainty. And hopefully in the future with additional statistics and additional, uh, additional well, sophisticated uh, technique for muon measurements, we'll be able to shape off that uncertainty even more such that you can, so that you can make well, your, Higgs, uh, your Higgs purchase with higher confidence with which, <laughs> which, whichever theoretical model you might be interested in. And that is all from my side. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so now you heard the latest breaking events and so on, as well as the story from the very beginning. And what this now provides is an opportunity for you to ask questions. The online audience have already asked 13 questions and actually voted on which ones they thought were the best. But we're not going to start necessarily with the online audience. I know some of you in the room voted here too, but some of you didn't. So what I'd like to do first is take several questions from the live audience on what are here, and then several from the audience that are online, and then we will rotate around until we've covered what we think are the most interesting questions. And so who has a question in the room? If you also ask it on Slido, you can ask the same one, of course, this time. Does it matter 
So I don't know, Gavin, Gavin answered that one. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, what use is it? Why do we? No, no, sure. Yeah. What? Uh, why? Why do we care in, within particle physics about having a very precise knowledge about the Higgs mass? Um, one answer to that is that there is. So within the standard model, there is no prediction at all for what the Higgs mass is. But in other theories, uh, theories of physics beyond the standard model, try to explain more features of the world around us. Uh, there. Are, some of those theories do make a prediction for the Higgs mass. And knowing the Higgs mass very precisely can be crucial in establishing that those other theories are right or wrong. Um, the Higgs mass also feeds into questions about, is the universe stable? Do we think it should be stable, given what we know about particles? Uh, and that's also a place where uh, it's of interest. Thank you. Did he answer your question? <laughs> so that's take another question from the room. Okay, over here. I can just pass this to you. If one thing I get, if the Higgs boson has a preferred way of decaying that it does the most often, um, how is it um, much more? How is it more useful to study the decays that ha happen less often? I'm sorry, it was probably explained in your speech somewhere, but I still don't really understand why it's more useful to study the um, less often decays. Yeah, we'd like to take that one. Chris, Chris wants to take it. So, yeah, so um, I think. What, what we didn't uh, show uh, so clearly in, in my plots, there were in particular the, the, the four lepton plot. Uh, when it decays as ZZ in four leptons, it's only one in, I think, 20,000. But, uh, but there's even more rare is the decays of uh, gamma, gamma. Yeah, this is gamma gamma. In the, in the four leptons, even more rare is the, is the standard model pr production of two Z bosons uh, at that mass. It's because the Z bosons have, have mass of, of 91 GV. So you produce two of them, they, you get an effective mass that's like 180. And so something at 120 with four leptons is extremely rare in the standard model. So even though it's also rare to produce Higgs bosons, there's almost there's very little background. Whereas in the case of BB bar production, you're producing so many Bs in your, in your uh, detector that um, that yeah, you don't. It's very hard to pick out the the the, the Higgs, small Higgs signal much like in, in that huge background. So you want something that's very it's like very low noise to see. It, even though it's rare, to see the blips above the sort of noiseless. Uh, yeah. Thanks. But again, I would also add that some other rare decays are extremely important. Uh, and it will be very difficult to, to find, perhaps. Like, for example, the decay of the X to CC bar, you know, that will establish if also the Higgs does give mass also to the quark of the second generation. And that is really a dark, a, a nightmare, in a sense, because it's very tiny and it has a huge background. Okay. Did you get your question answered? Yes. Yeah, excellent. So what I'm going to do now is take one from the online audience before we go to more questions from the audience in the room. And so this question is, do, and this is to all the speakers, do you think things may change once or if you find what dark matter is? What can young students look to find in the next 30 to 40 years? This is a very interesting question. Who would like to take it first? So, so the question is really, if, if we were to find dark matter, Really, what it's asking is whether that might have some connection to the Higgs, in which case it would affect how we think about the Higgs, perhaps, or maybe it's nothing to do with that, in which case, what else might we be looking for? What can young students contribute when they get old enough to start looking at the data? And then, really, old and get like us, what are they going to have found by then? So, really asking about the future and also the relationship with not matter. So, it's a very open question, and they'd like all of us to answer it. Who wants to start? Um, I think 
Well, let me talk about a connection between dark, potential connection between dark matter and the Higgs. Um, what we know is that dark matter interacts very weakly with anything else around us, other than through gravitation. And so one of the questions that I think we'd want to answer is, uh, and where the Higgs might come into the game, is that maybe the Higgs is a portal to dark matter. So maybe dark matter doesn't interact directly with any of the particles we're made of, but maybe it interacts with the Higgs, and the Higgs can interact with the particles we're made of. And that might give us a way of seeing dark matter. And that's one of the questions that, uh, that might be answered. Um, and whether, that, whether it goes that way really depends on, uh, on what form we see dark matter in. Um, because it can take many, many different forms. Uh, it can have a very light mass, a very heavy mass. Uh, we know essentially nothing about dark matter. Thank you. Who else would like to take that one? We don't need all of us to answer. I can take that. Uh, OK, so what I would say, well, we don't know at all what it is dark matter. It might not be at all a particle might be a wave, uh, maybe very light, and so we might not discover it at the Large Hadron Collider. We don't know what it is. Uh, but uh, it could still also a little bit be connected with the Higgs boson. We don't know yet. I mean, uh, like uh, at the moment we are measuring, you know, if we measure all of the decay of the Higgs very precisely, we can understand what is missing, and what is missing could maybe still uh, you know, give us an explanation for dark matter. So in my opinion, I'm an experimentalist. I have to measure. And once we measure everything, we will let you know. <laughs> okay, so we can't really ask the person in the, in the, in the, in the online audience whether we really answered that question. <laughs> but I assume that we did. If they don't, they can send another comment in that window. And while we're waiting for that comment, let's take another question from the room. Okay, up there. There's two people in that row and then one on the far left. So three people will ask questions now. They're all interested in almost in the same row, I see from here. That's significant. <laughs> Four people. Okay. Starting with the, the guy with the tie. He was putting the up the tie first. He was also taking notes during the lecture I watched. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if higher mass particles like the top quark are able to significantly affect the Higgs field as well as the Higgs boson, does that suggest that lower mass particles, when they're in tandem, such as in nuclei, are also able to significantly affect the Higgs field? Okay, who would like to say that one? <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe one thing to, to say about that is that the, the up and down quark, um, they're weighing a few MeV mega electron volts, uh, and the top quark weighs 173 giga electron volts. Um, so that's about uh, 50,000 times larger than masses of the up and down quarks. So the up and down quarks really perturb the Higgs field very, very little. And if you take three of them, um, that would still remain a very small perturbation. But one of the funny things is that uh, for them to work in concert, for them to work together, they'd actually have to really be in exactly the same place. And they're spread over a distance, which by our standards is tiny, about a Fermi, it's called, the size of a, an atomic nucleus, the hydrogen nucleus. But to work in tandem to affect the Higgs field, they'd have to be much, much closer. They'd have to be out about 500 times closer than they are normally in order for them to work in tandem on the Higgs field. Thank you. Next, next question was the person there with your hand up. Now, put your hand back up and get the mic to him. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is all very interesting from a theoretical scientist point of view and from the experimentalists who actually prove the theory right. But how is it applied? What is the benefit to us today in living our lives and our technology? How is this going to actually be of some use? Well, I would like also to bring the student into this uh, discussion, actually. I think that uh, um, by working in this big experiment, the student uh, and, uh, you know, develop uh, uh, amazing tools in terms of uh, uh, big data, 
uh, they all learn, for example, you know, um, the application of uh, machine learning and trying to extract uh, these things from uh, this huge background. There is also the fallout of the technology. Some of the technologies that are used in, uh, um, you know, um, in the large adult collider, the, uh, you know, the silicon detector, the pixel detector, et cetera, they find different applications. The calorimetries that we use in particle physics are using positron emitted tomography. So there are a lot of application of the machine, for example, the machine uh, are used many, uh, you know, many accelerators now are used around the world to uh, treat uh, patients, for example. Uh, some of the uh, uh, detectors that we build are used for that. And again, uh, the enormous, you know, we, in, in a sense, uh, the, what we were trying to do at the LHC uh, brought also the World Wide Web. So there are a lot of uh, applications and developments that are linked to our, uh, to what we are doing. And maybe actually, so, I think it would be good to answer this because here's someone that's actually moved out into the real world. So you can say what your experiences being a student in this amazing place and at CERN led to you now doing. Yeah. Uh, so just, just before I talk about that, I think it's um, it's, uh, it's it's nice to talk applications, but but not, but, but it's also important to remember that uh, this is answering some of the most important questions on, on, on like the, the grand scale of, of things. Where, where do we come from? How, how it's all, how it all works together. So it's the pursuit of this is, is kind of important to us as a species, I guess. Um, but, but, but on this journey, we, we as, as Daniela mentioned, there's a lot of technological discoveries, um, things that, we've, that have been done at CERN, uh, you know, 50 years ago are now used in, in, in the hospitals uh, for better imaging. Um, the World Wide Web has also been mentioned. Uh, in, in my particular case, and I think more recently, this has been quite um, uh, important, has, has, has been the software side. So there's, there's been a lot of, um, uh, you know, uses of, of big data, uh, uses of machine learning. It's, it's, a, it's a huge training center, let's say, for, for the data scientists of, of today and tomorrow. Um, and that's one aspect that, that in today's kind of, uh, information age is, is really uh, important. I'm, in my particular case, I, I now work as a, as a research software engineer in a, um, uh, in, in, a, in a software company that optimizes uh, electricity grids in, in North America. So if, if you ask someone what's the application is like, you know, it's, it's very hard to, <laughs> to expect something like this, but, but physicists go out and, and do all sorts of uh, weird and wonderful things with uh, skills that they've gained in, in data analysis and, and searching for the, the searching for and studying exposing. In addition to all of those things, if you look at studies that have been done of the amount of money, the amount of funds it took to make the LX sheet, and then do a study of what the benefit has been to the economy, it's many times the cost of the LX sheet. And those studies were done by independent people that do not work for some. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll take another question in the room. I think there's one this side now. This side next, and then the guy there afterwards. Since the Higgs boson is so essential to, or we think is so essential to giving things mass, what contribution and use could it have in quantum gravity? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so physicists have a, a deep principle, um, which is that when things are on different energy scales, they're effectively independent of each other. Uh, and the energy scale where uh, the Higgs physics is relevant, around the mass of the Higgs boson, 125 GeV, um, is way, way, way below what we think is the scale of quantum gravity, which is about 10 to the power of 16 GeV. Um, so based on the, this sort of fundamental principle that physicists have, we expect almost no connection, with one exception. 
And the Higgs is really special because almost all other particles, that, that separation of energy scales is pretty robust. But there's a mystery to do with the Higgs, uh, which is that when people do their calculations, it is the one particle for which that separation of energy scales is not robust. Um, and there's some debate about, you know, about what I've just said. But essentially, um, people, many people believe that the Higgs should be affected by quantum gravity and that it should acquire a mass that is of the same magnitude as quantum gravity, the quantum gravity scale. And one of the mysteries is why it is that the Higgs is so, so, so very much lighter than that quantum gravity scale. Um, and people have been attacking this problem for almost as long as the Higgs boson has been theorized, long before it was discovered. And they have many ideas. Um, but experimentally, we have no, no clues yet as to whether any of those ideas are right. But there could be a deep connection. So I think that's a great answer. Um, there's one online, there's two online that are somewhat connected to what we're talking about here. One of them is, does the Higgs boson interact with itself? How would you like to say a little bit about that, Kevin? Sure. Um, actually, this is a really important question. Um, so one thing I didn't talk about is why this Higgs field around us is non-zero. I said it is, and I said there's no source for that. It's not like the magnetic pole, like the sort of magnet inside the Earth. Uh, and the reason that people, physicists believe that the reason it's non-zero is that it's energetically favorable. There's a sort of a, a potential energy as a function of the Higgs, value of the Higgs field. And the lowest potential energy is at a non-zero value of that Higgs field. And one of the questions is why, what is that potential? Uh, theorists, of course, have gone and written down an expression for it. It's really simple. It's just got two terms in it. Um, but is that thing that theorists have written down correct? What is the potential that causes this Higgs field to be non-zero? And the way you can answer that is actually by looking at how Higgs bosons interact with each other. And so one of the things that experimenters hope to do in the next 10, 15 years is to start to get a, a rough constraint on what that Higgs potential looks like. But almost certainly, we'll need another collider in order to really pin down the answer to, to what that Higgs potential is. And so why it is that the Higgs field is non-zero. That, that's a great answer. The connect, connected question um, is the person says here, uh, why do neutrinos not interact with the Higgs field? Uh, of course, uh, they may. But, uh, <laughs> well, that's so that, uh, that the person who asked that question was very perceptive because I left neutrinos out of my <laughs> diagram of what particles interact with are, are interacting with the Higgs field. We don't really know what the origin of neutrino masses is. Um, or rather, we have theories. We have several theories. And whereas the standard model is the favored theory for most of the, part of, for the particles we're made of in terms of how they get their mass, there isn't really a single favored theory for how neutrino gets their, get, neutrinos get their mass. It could be that they just interact extremely weakly with the Higgs field, much more weakly than any of the, any of the particles we're made of. Um, or it could be that they, there are other particles involved. Uh, and it's uh, dynamics between different particles, some very heavy ones and some lighter ones, that give the neutrinos their masses. But this is, uh, this is a very intriguing question. And uh, some of the ex neutrino experiments happening in the US and in Japan, on which people from Oxford are also involved, may give us some clues as to what the, what the answer is there. I think I've answered my share of questions. <laughs> I just wanted to add something about the Higgs self-interaction, because we will study experimentally by looking at uh, when we produce two Higgs boson in our detector, OK? And uh, that is extremely rare phenomena. It's like uh, 1,000 times smaller than the production of one Higgs boson. So it's very difficult. But Higgs 2BB bar will play a unique role to that, because the Higgs decays more to Higgs 2BB bar. And so you know, we will look at finite state with uh, 2B, 4Bs, 
uh, with two bees and two photons, with two bees and two taus. Uh, so it's going, but it's going to be very, very challenging. We will need a lot of data. And at the, LH, at the ILUMI LHC, which is the upgrade of the LHC, we will measure that maybe with a 50% error, and we will need a very big collider to measure that very precisely. That's a great answer. And now I think we go back to the room. Uh, it, the guy in the row there, that's right, you're next. And thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting. And I just wanted to add on to the question that the gentleman on my left asked earlier. And that's to ask if, if given that the Higgs, that the excitation of the Higgs field is associated with the Higgs boson and that other particles such as the top quark can interact with the field. Um, how are we sure that the Higgs field is entirely associated with the Higgs boson? And in addition to that, given that other particles can interact with the Higgs field and probably even excite it, how would this affect the masses of other particles in the standard model and in consequence, the nature of the interactions between these particles. Yep, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> so much my hope is handing the microphone back. <laughs> um, there were quite a lot of uh, questions there. So, okay, so let, let me try and unpack different elements of that. So how do we know that the Higgs the Higgs boson is, uh, is really entirely connected with the Higgs field. Well, in a sense, uh, if it weren't, we would start to see inconsistency. So if the, the Higgs field, uh, if there was some kind of mixture of two Higgs fields uh, inducing masses, and the Higgs boson were an excitation of just one of those Higgs fields, um, that's a sort of scenario that you can imagine, then we would see inconsistencies in the data between uh, what we expect the interaction strength of the Higgs boson with particles to be and what we measure it to be. So one of the big questions is, and this is a reason why experimentalists are uh, so eager to collect more data, is uh, right now they have measured these interaction strengths at about the 10% level. But you could imagine that there's some, some anomaly, some mixture of Higgs fields, uh, they would cause differences uh, between what we expect and what we see at the few percent level. Uh, so the experiments are trying to measure this, uh, these interactions ever more precisely. And ultimately with future colliders, aiming for some of these interactions to get to the sub percent level, to really pin down what's going on. Because if we think about electromagnetism, if we tested electromagnetism to only 10%, we wouldn't say it's established. We wouldn't write it in textbooks as the definitive theory. Uh, and if we want to write what we've been talking about today as the definitive theory in textbooks, then 10% is a bit borderline in terms of being certain that it's right. Now, to come back to another question, you asked about uh, what does this imply for interactions between particles? And I think one of the aspects of the Higgs boson that, that really hasn't gotten the attention that it might deserve, uh, is that it introduces a new force. So we're used to talking about four forces. There's gravity, electromagnetism, the weak force, and the strong force. But the minute the Higgs boson was discovered, we knew there was a fifth force, the Higgs force. And the Higgs force is really remarkable because electromagnetism uh, works with electric charges. And electric charges come in units. You can have one times the electron, two times the electron charge, three times the electron charge. And it's the same with the strong force and with the weak force. They all come in multiples of some unit. And the Higgs force is the only microscopic force that we know of that doesn't work like that. It doesn't come in multiples of certain units. In fact, the strength for one particle seems some random non-integer multiple of the strength for another particle. We have no understanding of this, this pattern of different strengths. Um, so this sort of new fifth force that is involved with it, that is mediated by the Higgs boson is really a, a very remarkably different force from the ones we know. 
Okay, that's great. So, I mean, time is moving on. There's an interesting question that was asked online, which is, and this is a question that any of us could answer, not just Gavin in this case. <laughs> Do you think there will be another highlight, like the discovery of the Higgs within your career? And if so, what would it be? So I, mean, I, I, can, I can perhaps answer this because uh, right now, actually, we have just uh, made a measurement that, that uh, could potentially rival the discovery of the Higgs. Um, <laughs> because uh, I'm measuring the, the W boson, the mass of the W boson, which um, has effects for uh, quantum effects where, where, where if you more precisely you measure it, the more you can learn about the other particles that there can be. Uh, and so within the standard model, you, you can calculate the mass within all, with all the other particles there are and including the Higgs boson. And the measurement that we've made is quite a bit different. It's, it's seven sigma. So you, you heard five sigma was the discovery of the Higgs. This is now more than a discovery level um, measurement. Uh, but the, there's a big question mark, which is um, there's some differences between other experimental measurements. And, um, and so there's some uh, questions about how, uh, what, what this could be. But it could be, but if it's if it's if it's telling us what it would tell us if it's right, is that there must be some something new out there that is at the sort of 10 TeV scale or less. So uh, LHC can produce particles, and we can discover particles up to maybe a few TeV. So if this is right, with another collider that's a bit bigger, we we should be discovering particles. So it could it could be telling us like we knew the Higgs must be there. If this is right, it could tell us there must be something else that's out there. So this is, for me already, uh, if this holds up. And so this is something that uh, we're going to be studying this measurement and other measurements and, and trying to see if this is really uh, what we think is, what our measurement is right, uh, is pointing us in the right direction. Uh, this could be j just as big for me. Uh, but, uh, but there are other, uh, yeah, many other things that could happen. We could discover dark matter and so on and so forth. So, Maybe yeah, leave that to other people to comment. Okay. So, so one of the things I think could be found, if you look back at the predictions of what the LHC would find, uh, there were people that expected to find the Higgs, and there were people that expected to find a thing called supersymmetry. And supersymmetry is the last unused symmetry of a very fundamental group called the Poincaré group, which includes things like rotations and so on. And so it relates fermions spin half particles to bosons, which are integer spin particles. And it makes many, many predictions. However, it's difficult to know which of those many, many predictions might be right ones. But why we like the idea of supersymmetry is because it would help address why it is that the Higgs is so light. So it may be that Although we haven't found supersymmetry of the LHC yet, it's simply because nature is more subtle than we expected and it hides very well. Nature does not give out its secrets lightly. If it did, we wouldn't have had to build the Large Hadron Collider. And, and we wouldn't have had to build LIGO. And we wouldn't have to build the incredible new telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope and the Rubin Telescope and many others that are coming online around the world. And we wouldn't have to go deep underground looking for evidence for particles that you would not see if you were on the surface of the Earth because there's so much radiation from space that they would be swamped by the natural noise of the environment. We go deep underground and we put tanks that are often tens or hundreds of tons of noble liquids. And then we keep it all very dark and we look to see if there may be a particle moving through them that could be dark matter. Now it turns out that the dark matter would be a natural consequence also of supersymmetry. And so there were lots of reasons why people thought these were good ideas, and then we didn't find anything. However, there are so many ways in which supersymmetry could manifest itself. And given that we've only taken 4% of the data that the LHC would take in its lifetime, there's every reason to be optimistic there'll be some type of discovery, and one of them could be evidence for a supersymmetric uh, nature. I can just add to that. Hopefully, there won't be any technical issues this time. But 
I think the other thing, just so just to follow up on the uh, on Chris's point on dark matter, I think that will be another incredible discovery that could potentially happen in the lifespan of my career, since I'm a lot considerably younger <laughs> than the rest of you. <laughs> So just in terms of probability, it's a lot more likely that I will live through for long enough to see it. <laughs> so for, for example, as mentioned by Ian, there are colleagues of ours who are, work, uh, who are working in Dr. Zeppelin experiments who are searching for weakly interacted particles or WIMPs uh, for short. And these will be quite incredible to discover as we can also, as we can also measure, uh, we can also, um, observe it through the potentially the interaction from Higgs. So for example, if a Higgs just uh, is produced from the Large Hadron Collider and then it disappears into nothing that we can detect of, that could be a very convincing well, evidence for dark matter statistics because we cannot detect it by definition. So yes, so hopefully I'll live long enough for it to see, it that, <laughs> see that one day. I think you will live plenty long enough to see that happen. It may well happen. Oh, thank uh, you. What I would say is that we're incredibly lucky already, because today we have thought back at the anniversary of this Higgs boson discovery. And I said at the beginning of my talk that the Higgs boson is something that's very remarkable and something that's very special. And it's also something that physicists in other areas of our field would actually die to be able to probe. There are people in condensed matter physics, and they look at how materials work, and they invent new materials, they invent new metals. They try to engineer all kinds of different phenomena in those solid state objects so they can fit on the top of a table. But what, it, what is extremely, extremely difficult for them to engineer is something like the Higgs boson. The reason why the Higgs boson is so special is not just because it's so simple, but also because we have never seen something like the Higgs boson anywhere else in nature. The only place where we have run into it so far is in elementary particle physics. And that means. We now have an object which you know exists, the Higgs boson, and we have the equipment and the personnel to be able to probe it. We have these wonderful laboratories, these cameras that probe the Higgs boson. And we have time until 2030s to look at it and to probe it in much, much more detail. And what that will mean is that we will be able to do something that nobody else before in the history of science was able to do, namely to study the very simplest thing that could possibly happen in this universe. And that itself is poised to tell us a lot about the internal structure and the consistency of our understanding of the world. Mir, do you want to take, it's very hard for me to go last because everyone's covered everything we could possibly imagine at this point. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I'll, I'll, just say, I'll just say I have a bet with a friend that uh, I'm claiming we'll see dark matter before commercially available fusion. Uh, <laughs> As, as much as I'd like to see otherwise. <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great answer. Okay, so I think at that point, it's now almost nine o'clock. I just wanted to say one more thing, though, that uh, at the end, it's a good time to be an experimentalist. <laughs> that's right. So I want to thank all the panel again for their answers. Thank all the online audience for staying with us right to the end and asking so many great questions. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. Please give the panel a round of applause. Thank you.